Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very much for your warm welcome and for your generous reception. And may I say what a privilege it is to be here, what an honor uh, to give the Herman Lectures uh, for this year, and also what a privilege it is also to have the Herman family down here uh, on the front row. Um, so thank you very much indeed, and I'm waiting for my first slide to come up, and there it is. During the early 1980s, I agreed to uh, write a book for land publishing in Oxford on the topic of science and faith. It was actually intended as a replacement for a book that I'd written a long time ago called Beyond Science, uh, which I published way back in 1972. And during the early 1980s, I was on the medical faculty of the American University of Beirut teaching and researching in something called the National Unit of Human Genetics. It was a time when the Civil War was raging and it was often best to stay indoors in the evenings to avoid the shelling and the kidnapping. Perfect time, thought I, to write a book. And uh, I even gave it a title, Science and Faith at the End of the 20th Century. Now, fortunately, it turned out that the university library was well endowed with books on the history and philosophy of science. And what was even better, it was located underground on the campus, so well protected from those stray mortars and shells which occasionally dropped onto the campus more by accident than by design, I'm quite sure. But there I began to browse through the wonderful collection of books that they had. I remember well uh, Galileo's letter to the Duchess Christina, first published in 1615, a key text on science faith relationships from the early modern period. There it is, American University of Beirut Library. 19th century essays of Thomas Henry Huxley, the Princeton historian Charles Gillespie's groundbreaking books from the early 1960s and before, and even a complete set of nature, the journal Nature going all the way back to November the 4th, 1869, just three years after the founding of the university there by American missionaries. Well, in the end, we experienced our third and final evacuation from Beirut in uh, 1986, and back in England, there really was no longer the excuse of shelling and kidnapping to keep one inside, writing books in the evenings. And also, I'm afraid the, the century didn't really prove long enough. And so my very faithful and patient publisher uh, was happy when the book finally came out in 2001, the book that was just mentioned, Rebuilding the Matrix, Science and Faith in the 21st Century. As I say, the 20th century sort of ran out on us for the original title. But the reason for this rather long-winded introduction is to just highlight the point, really, that these three Herman lectures are very much an attempt to continue and to extend the theme of this book, Rebuilding the Matrix. The matrix refers to that Christian theological matrix from within which modern science emerged and within which the book argues it finds its most natural home. But how comfortably does science, especially the biological sciences, continue to sit within the, this cre uh, Christian matrix? The slightly anxious tone is well captured by the overall theme of these lectures, is life going anywhere, creation, biology, randomness, and purpose. For, for many people, I think biology, at least at first look, can often appear rather threatening to faith, replete with words like chance and random, stochastic, purposeless, and so forth. The situation today seems very different from that which faced John Ray, a key Christian founder of the discipline of natural history that later came to be called biology, who was a student and then a fellow at Trinity College in Cambridge. Ray complained that far too many scholars were taken up with the humanities and that natural history was being neglected. But it was largely due to his own efforts and other passionately Christian natural historians of the 17th century that the tide began to turn, especially as the study of natural history became closely linked with the argument from design and the behaviors of animals were deployed for their use in moral teaching. Ray, in fact, was the first to give us the idea of a biological species coming up to Trinity College in Cambridge, our Cambridge that is, at the tender age of 16 in 1643, later becoming a fellow, writing one of the foundational works in the whole history of biology, the wisdom of God manifested in the works of creation. 
And Ray chose to teach some of the uh, material that later came into, uh, became this book, not in a lecture hall, but in the chapel of Trinity College in Cambridge because he saw his teaching of science as an act of worship, just as much as the hymns that were being sung <coughs> in the chapel at that time. And also, by the 18th century, natural history did indeed become much more central to the academic interests of European universities. The French Cartesian philosopher Nicolas Marbanche claiming in a wonderful piece of hyperbole, and I quote, the one insect is more in touch with divine wisdom than the whole of Greek and Roman history, close quote. And in his history of the Royal Society, Bishop Thomas Spratt went so far as to claim that the formal study of nature had been the original religion of Adam in paradise. Well, with those few introductory thoughts as a backcloth, it might be helpful for you if I set out a roadmap to see where we're going to go in this series of three lectures. So in today's lecture, The Lion's Roar, Creation and Biology, we'll be laying out this Christian matrix of creation theology within which I will be suggesting contemporary biology finds itself very comfortably at home, just as it did for John Ray and those other great Christian pioneers in the 17th century. Indeed, I'm going to be proposing that it is a very traditional creation theology as introduced for us in the biblical texts, then expounded by the early church fathers, that expounded in the 13th century by Thomas Aquinas, and then by the reformers, especially Calvin a few centuries later, that taken together provide that matrix within which biology can flourish and can provide also a coherent story of life. And so my emphasis in this lecture this evening is going to be on a theology of nature, which we can then interrogate on the subject of chance and randomness. The second lecture, The Farmer Sows, Biology, Randomness and Purpose, tomorrow night, we're going to focus then more on biology itself. And instead of asking the question, does biology display a narrative of purpose, we will instead be turning the question on its head in seeking to address the concerns of the so-called new atheists as we ask the question, is the biological story necessarily purposeless? That might sound like the same question in disguise, but I'm going to be arguing that it's in fact subtly different. And moreover, that masses of data from both evolutionary history and contemporary molecular biology stack up to give a firm no in answer to that question. Which answer will take us straight then into the topic of the third lecture, the creation groans, biology and theodicy, for if the present created order is indeed the one that God intends with its biology purposed and sustained by him, as we'll be thinking about this evening, then we cannot avoid that great question which we're going to need to take straight on the chin without ducking as to how could it be that the God of love of Christian faith should have chosen to bring all of biological diversity into being by a long process which is involved and continues to involve so much death and suffering. And I'm sure you'll be relieved to hear that in none of these lectures will we be particularly concerned about the subject of origins, nor about indeed the interpretation of the early chapters of Genesis, but instead I want us to consider together this broader picture of our Trinitarian God as creator in the great sweep of creation, past, present, and future, and how biology fits into that matrix so provided. This grand creation narrative is composed of a myriad different insights scattered liberally through the Old and New Testaments. And the overall discussion between science and faith is pretty much set by the degree to which we allow that range of insights to impact upon our thinking. Important as the early chapters of Genesis may be, they represent but a rather small proportion of the overall corpus of the biblical literature on the subject of creation. And the picture that emerges is of a God who is the source and ground of all that exists. Everything that exists apart from God has only come into existence because God has brought it into existence. So God is the ground of all existence, and in, in this view, existence refers to anything that exists, be it they, the laws of nature, quantum vacuums, Higgs bosons, rabbits, trees, the elements of the periodic table, whatever. If it exists and it is not God, 
then it must by definition be part of the created order within this theistic matrix. Now, one challenge, of course, comes from the way in which we use the word create in the English language and then apply it to God. When human beings make things, they work with already existing material to produce something new. The human act of creating is not the complete cause of what is produced, but God's creative act is the complete cause of what is produced. As the theologian Bill Carroll puts it, and I quote, God's causality is so different from the causality of creatures that there is no competition between the two. That is, we do not need to limit, as it were, God's causality to make room for the causality of creatures. God causes creatures to be causes. Creation is not essentially some distant event. Rather, it is the ongoing complete causing of the existence of all that is. At this very moment, were God not causing all that is to exist, there would be nothing at all. Creation concerns, first of all, the origin of the universe, not its temporal beginning, close quote. So, in this picture of creation, creation is about ontology. It's about the existence of things and especially the meanings of their existence. And certainly, God is not like the demiurge of Plato's Timaeus. And since our great creator God is not encompassed or constrained in any way by the present created order in which we find ourselves, that means that we as human creatures are in no position at all to guess how God might wish to do creation, nor to tell him how he should be doing it. As God says, in a slightly different context, speaking to the prophet Isaiah, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. Our God is in heaven, says the psalmist. He does whatever pleases him. And historians of science have often pointed to this sense of the transcendence of God and the consequent radical contingency of the created order as one of those great motivations for empiricism, for the experimental method. For no one could simply guess how the created order might work, starting from common sense or simple human logic. Quantum mechanics is simply weird, and pictorial representations in the head should not be attempted. Um, I see you want a headache, that is. Had we been visiting this planet four billion years ago when it was a desolate, inchoate mass of disorganized materials undergoing frequent asteroid bombardment, no one could have predicted that after 3.8 billion years of evolutionary history, it would become the home of saints and sinners. This point was made explicitly by Coates in his preface to the second edition of Isaac's great work, the Principia Mathematica, in words clearly approved by Newton himself. Coates writes, without all doubt, this world could arise from nothing but the perfectly free will of God. These laws of nature, therefore, we must not seek from uncertain conjectures, but learn them from observations and experiments. René Descartes makes a similar point in these words. Since there are countless different configurations which God might have instituted here, experience alone, experiments, must teach us which configurations he actually selected in preference to the rest. We are thus free to make any assumption on these matters with the sole proviso that all the consequences of our assumption must agree with experience, by which he meant the experimental method. And along with the transcendent otherness of God in the biblical literature comes a major, ins a major insistence on the simultaneous imminence of God in the created order, that moment-by-moment -moment involvement in upholding and sustaining the created order, God's faithfulness being displayed in the gnomic regularity, the law-like behavior of energy and matter which renders the world coherent and makes the scientific enterprise possible. This is a Trinitarian imminence. Right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1-3, the Spirit of God hovers over the waters, ready to bring order out of the formless and empty earth. Or in Hebert's memorable translation, far from being the hovering of a bird, the ruach, the wind, becomes the wind sweeping in on a storm from the Mediterranean. God's ruach swept over the surface of the water. As the theologian Jürgen Moltmann expresses the point 
The divine spirit, the Ruach, is the creative power and the presence of God in his creation. The whole creation is a fabric woven by the spirit and is therefore a reality to which the spirit gives form. Calvin put it this way in his Institutes, for it is a spirit who everywhere diffuses, sustains all things, causes them to grow, and quickens them in heaven and on earth, in transfusing into all things his energy and breathing into them essence, life, and movement. He is indeed plainly divine. And the New Testament tells us that we live in a Christological creation. Using one of the most powerful metaphors in the whole of the New Testament, John tells us in the prologue to his gospel that through the Logos, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In Colossians 1, Paul writes that by the Son of God, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In other words, the complete created order in all its breadth and diversity goes on consisting by that same divine word, the Logos, the Lord Jesus, who brought everything into being in the first place. The point is further underlined by the writer to the Hebrews when he writes that the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. God is the one for whom and through whom all things exist or everything exists. So he is no absentee landlord, but rather the key to the whole of existence. Trinitarian creation entails an active holding in existence of the complete created order. Charles Raven was previously master of Christ College, Cambridge. He was, that's Charles Darwin's old college. He was a very influential voice in the science faith dialogue in the early part of the 20th century. And he put it once like this. God as father was like an artist deciding to create a picture. God the son was the design on which the work was modeled. And the Holy Spirit was the creative energy in the artist that created the picture. And it is this spirit-energized, Christological, created order that the Old Testament insists is a biologically fruitful, created order. And so in Psalm 104, God makes grass grow for cattle and plants for man to cultivate. It is God who supplies food for lions who roar for their prey and seek their food from God. How many are your works, O Lord, cries the psalmist, In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And then in verse 29 and 30 of Psalm 104, we have this very remarkable observation that God's creative work is involved in the very processes of animal life and death that would have been so familiar to the rural communities of that time. When you hide your face, they, the animals, are terrified. When you take away their ruch, their breath, they die and return to the dust, When you send your spirit, they are bara, they are created, the strong word used for create in Hebrew, where God is always the author, and you renew the face of the earth. And the book of Job, of course, has further wonderful descriptions of God's authorship of the biological world, who provides food for the raven when it's young, cry out to God and wander about for lack of food. The eagle soars at God's command and builds his nest on high. His young ones feast on blood, and where the slain are, they is he, there is he. There's no shrinking back here from biological realities. Now, as we consider both the transcendence and the imminence of God in the created order, a further striking observation emerges from the biblical narratives, and that is the three tenses of creation. Creation in the Bible, like salvation, has three tenses, past, present, and future. There is a definite biblical sense of looking back at creation, at all that God has done in the past, and bringing this world of rich biological diversity into being. But we also read of a God who is actively involved in the created order in the present tense, just as we've been thinking. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all intimately involved in creatio continua, the ongoing work of creation. As Jesus remarked in John 5, after healing the man on the Sabbath, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. And then as far as future creation is concerned, God tells us through the prophet Isaiah, behold, I will create, I will borrow, 
a new heavens and a new earth. And so the biblical doctrine of creation tells us about a dynamic process in which God is the author of the narrative. And Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God's creation encompasses past, present, and future. That's the matrix. Now, all analogies are limited, but God's continuing creative activity has been likened to the continual flow of digital signals without which there would be no picture on our TV screen. Our favorite TV TV drama is a self-contained drama, and talk of digitally encoded signals will add nothing to it, and yet without the continuous signals, the drama would cease to be conveyed to your living room. God is that continuing author of creation. To use a different analogy, God is both the musical composer and conductor in relation to the symphony of creation, the one who is imminent in the whole creative process as the beautiful harmony emerges from the coordinated output of the many different musical components. Maybe if you like jazz, there is plenty of improvisation along the way to produce basically the same theme. So, with that in mind then, what do we biologists do in our research? Well, clearly what we do is to seek to describe as best we can what God does in the created order, the consequences of his ongoing program of creation, often referred to as secondary causes, God's normal way of working. And biologists do this not by invoking the actions of God, the primary cause to explain those parts of the process which seem particularly difficult to understand, but rather by seeing the authorship of the creator expressed in the whole biological process from beginning to end. So when my atheist biologist colleagues pose the question, well, what difference does it make to your biology whether God exists or not? Three points immediately come to mind. The first is that if there were no God, nothing would exist. So we would certainly wouldn't be doing any science. Second, without God, gnomic regularity would be unexpected and certainly not guaranteed. The faithfulness of God in guaranteeing the reproducibility of the properties of matter is critical, obviously, for the success of science. I mean, outside of God's created power, why would an electron on this side of the universe have the same properties as one on the other side of the universe, we presume? Outside of God, I don't think the the answer is that obvious, actually. And third, the fact of common grace and all being made in the image of God, irrespective of whether we believe in God or not, entails that we as a scientific community can share in the same scientific methods and approaches to understanding the biological world. Where the theistic matrix becomes most relevant here is not in seeking to God to bring God on occasion into our scientific papers, as if God were merely some further component within our repertoire of scientific explanations, a theologically problematic stance that reduces God to the status of one explanatory component amongst many, but rather in the interpretation of our discoveries within the light of that theological matrix. Putting it somewhat oversimplistically, science is about explanations for the being and becoming of material things. Theology is about their overall interpretation. Now, if we're willing to accept this brief outline of the creation biology matrix, then a number of questions and qualifying points immediately press themselves upon us. First, and most obviously, it is all very well to portray God as the creator of all living things, but how exactly does God interact with the world? Dozens of conferences, dozens of books have been written upon this question of divine action. So... I can only just mention a few simple thoughts on that matter here. But it seems to me that theological questions demand theological answers. I say this because there have been a number of commentators over the past few decades who have sought to locate the nexus of divine action in particular scientific properties of the world, be this in quantum uncertainty, chaos theory, or some other particular feature of the created order. Worthy as such efforts have been, I think it is difficult to avoid the impression that God in such scenarios ends up looking more like a tinkerer with nature rather than the author and sustainer of the whole created order. So said, I want to highlight this evening the language of top-down causation used by the Bible 
when it refers to the activity of God in creation, and that is the language of God speaking, the God who speaks. And that dramatic introduction to such language is, of course, in Genesis 1, where God speaks on every one of the six days to bring order and beauty into the world that is formless and empty. And there in chapter 1 also, we have that language of gracious permission. Verse 11, let the land produce vegetation. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth, says the psalmist in Psalm 33 and verse 6. Speaking expresses power, mind, will, intelligence. Through top-down causation, we ourselves exert dramatic influence through language over the behavior of those around us every day, and we take it for granted. Please, would you pass the salt, we say to someone at the dinner table, and our invisible words have a huge top-down causation, immediate impact upon the desi desired result. No breaking of scientific laws involved at all. Die for the sake of jihad, exhorts a preacher on YouTube, and a young man in London gives up his well-paid job to travel to Syria, there indeed, to die for the cause. Human words are incredibly powerful, how much more so divine words that bring creatio ex nihilo and that guarantee the properties of matter. As Isaac Barrow, who was the first to be appointed to the new Lucasian Chair of Mathematics in Cambridge, in 1663 expressed it, God uses no other means, instruments, or applications in these productions than his bare word or command, where productions here are referring to both the usual and the more unusual works of God in creation. Now this, of course, raises a number of further questions. Does this then entail a deterministic universe in which God is the divine puppet master micromanaging every event, I would want to say not at all. That's no necessary consequence of the creation theology that has been outlined so far. For by faithfully guaranteeing order and gnomic regularity in the properties of matter by his imminence in the created order, by the same token, God bestows upon the created order its own functional integrity. Some hint of this idea has already been alluded to in Genesis 1, where God uses that language of gracious permission, let the land produce vegetation. Matter does what matter does, and if it didn't, we wouldn't be here or know where we were with all coherence gone. Neither is the creation theology being presented here compatible with occasionalism, the idea that God's creation is actually a series of tr trillions and trillions of separate individual acts of creation joined together. Instead, creation represents a seamless cloth of God's authorship in which the cloth has its own functional and causal integrity. In fact, it's precisely because of the undergirding power of the Trinitarian God in which the created order is infused by the Spirit of Christ that this functional integrity exists in the first place. As mentioned earlier, God causes creatures to be causes. So if there's nothing necessarily different between the scientific understanding of the theistic biologist compared to the atheistic biologist as they both together in the same laboratory investigate the properties of God's world, that isn't the kind of creation biology that I'm suggesting here, not some covert form of naturalism. A move that is often made at this stage is to distinguish between so-called methodological naturalism and ontological naturalism. Methodological naturalism is presented as the benign form of naturalism in which scientists simply agree to keep theological explanations out of their scientific discourse, whereas ontological, nat ontological naturalism is the claim that in any case supernatural agency does not exist and the scientific explanation is therefore all that counts. But whilst recognizing that there is clear water between these two types of description, my view is that the language as a whole is not particularly helpful. As a scientist who is a Christian, I do not suddenly leave my Christian worldview behind when I enter the laboratory to do my experiments. Far from it, 
Exploring and seeking to understand God's world is a holy enterprise, part of a Christian's worship. A laboratory is a sacred space where the aim is to understand further the very works of God. And so naturalism may exist as a philosophy in the heads of individual scientists, but as far as Christians doing science is concerned, they are certainly not engaged in any kind of naturalism, neither methodological nor ontological. Another somewhat related concern arises from the kind of creation biology being presented here, in which creation is seen, as I've been saying, as having its own God-guaranteed functional integrity and therefore amenable to investigation by those of any faith or none. And that's the accusation of deism, the idea that God established scientific laws at the beginning, but then withdrew from the creation without any further interaction. It does seem likely that Charles Darwin held to a somewhat deistic view at the time when he was writing The Origin of Species, although some of his statements on this uh, particular point are somewhat ambiguous. So in the deistic worldview, God was the one who started life off, but it was then the fixed laws and natural processes that led to its great diversity. But the creation biology that we're discussing here is something quite different, theism, not deism, in which the author of life is intimately involved in every aspect of the created order from beginning to end. Some might have come across this author, J.K. Rowling, who's certainly sold uh, a few more copies of her books than I have of mine. And I remember listening to an interview with Rowling when she was asked some years ago how she had planned her seven Harry Potter, Potter novels. Rowling said that she had all the main characters written on little pieces of paper surrounding her on this living room floor. She had the main outline of those seven novels in her head before she even wrote a word. And I don't think there's any need for a spoiler alert when I say that she knew right from the beginning that Voldemort, that malevolent being, was going to die in the seventh and final volume. So the author then downloaded her mind into those seven novels. Much of the detail, of course, changed as she went along. In many cases, detailed conversations and the like could have been otherwise without changing the main plot. But it would make no sense at all to go to chapter two of the fifth novel in the second paragraph and say, aha, I've now found evidence that there is an author involved. Either there is an author of the whole series or not at all. And so theism is a claim that there is an author of everything that exists. And certainly when I think of that, it reminds me of these startling words of Peter as he preached on the day of Pentecost, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. Now thinking about such a robust form of theism, it's then a fair question to ask about miracles. Miracles in scripture are seen as special signs of God's grace to God's people, in particular historical circumstances. Often they involve the unusual working of God in the created order. But the usual properties of the created order involving the consistency in the properties of matter that are guaranteed by God's faithfulness are not seen by scripture as miraculous, although without doubt equally reflecting God's power and actions as much as in the miraculous. Indeed, it is the orderliness and predictability of the created order to which scripture draws attention. Wisdom was there at the beginning, according to Proverbs 8, when God established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundary so the waters would not overstep his command and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. The moon marks off the seasons and the sun knows when to go down, says the psalmist in 104 verse 19. This is the order of creation, God's normal pattern of activity, and it's against such an orderly background that miracles then stand out as unusual signs of God's grace and unusual workings in his own created order. So what about chance and randomness in biology and indeed in theology? Certainly the Bible displays no concern at all in describing chance events as ordained by God. When the prophet Micaiah predicted that King Ahab would be killed in the battle at Ramoth Gilead in 1 Kings 22, this indeed came to pass. But we read it happened by someone who drew his bow at random and hit the king of Israel between the sections of his armor. As Proverbs 16, 
so vividly puts the point, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. The psalmist speaks of lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, whereas we might now see the weather more as reflecting chaos theory. Perhaps most famous of all in this context is Joseph's comment to his brothers after he'd been put in charge of Pharaoh's storehouses after a long journey full of apparently random events, starting with imprisonment by the very brothers who were now seeking his help, saying to them, and I quote, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what, in, what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now let's think for a moment about the biology, especially evolutionary biology. The process is often portrayed as one of chance and randomness. But when we look a bit closer, we find the situation is a lot more complicated than that. The genome of an organism, meaning the sum total of the information contained in its DNA, is subject to continual change, even since we came in here this evening. Changes can happen through a very wide range of mechanisms, including point mutations, deletions, insertions, duplications. Many of these changes occur during cell replication, during which, of course, DNA replicates itself. As DNA is being replicated, proofreading enzymes check the sequence and correct any errors, but occasionally, like any proofreader, they miss some errors, and so the daughter cells contain new DNA that's slightly different from the parental DNA. And a major cause of variation is also the swapping over of small segments of DNA between the paired chromosomes of an individual during the formation of the sex cells, the sperm and the egg, a process known as recombination. So the slightly different DNA in the progeny will then lead to offspring that may be more fit from an evolutionary perspective, meaning more likely to pass their particular sets of gene variants onto more progeny in the future, the process known as natural selection, the testing out of variant genomes in the workshop of life to see which are most successful at generating organisms that are evolutionarily fit in a particular ecological niche. Now, changes come into the genome, of course, by chance. But all that means is that the changes come about with respect to the well-being, or otherwise, of the organism. And if we knew enough about the molecular details of the system, in principle, if not in practice, then we might be in a position to predict where the next replication error might occur in the genome in a given cell. But other mutations occur due to the decay of a radioisotope somewhere in the solar system. And radioactive decay is subject to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, meaning that it's impossible in principle, not just in practice, to know when a particular radioactive particle might cause a change in the genetic letter sequence in a particular genome. But note that as far as the overall process of evolution is concerned, it really doesn't matter how variation comes into the genome, by predictable processes or by those processes which are in principle non-predictable. Because in any case, the process of natural selection will exert its stringent winnowing effect. In evolutionary biology, in the balance between chance and necessity, it is necessity that wins in the end, as we'll be thinking about more in detail tomorrow night. And that's why Richard Dawkins, who you might have noticed is no particular friend of religion, can write in the preface to his book, The Wild Blind Watchmaker, that the main purpose he has, and notice this, the main purpose he has in writing this book is to destroy this eagerly believed myth that Darwinism is a theory of chance. Every evolutionary biologist knows that evolution is not a theory, ultimately a chance, taking the process overall. What about the role of chance in the evolutionary process at the overall level then of purpose and directionality? Tomorrow's lecture will be focusing on those types of questions. For the moment, we may simply note that chance and randomness are as much part of the created order as any other feature. And since the created order has its own functional integrity, these are real characteristics of that order. But at the same time, we should not imagine that God is in any way restricted in his sovereignty by our human understanding of chance. I have seen something else under the sun, says the writer of Ecclesiastes. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant, 
are favoured to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. But we may wish to add, of course, not outside of God's providential will and plan. So does the lion roar seeking its food from God? I would want to say, certainly, this is God's world. And within the matrix of creation theology, a world in which biology can happily flourish. We started this evening by thinking about John Ray, that great 17th century Christian natural philosopher who pioneered the detailed study of living things. So perhaps it's appropriate that we close with some words from Ray, who declared that he had published his ornithology for the illustration of God's glory by exciting men to take notice of and admire his infinite power and wisdom. And I would suggest that that's what we should be doing also. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so before I read uh, Stephen Pope's response, I, I want to introduce him so you will know a little bit more about the, the person behind this paper that I'm reading. Dr. Stephen Pope is professor of theology at Boston College. He received a BA in philosophy and theology from Gonzaga University and an MA in divinity from the University of Chicago and a PhD in theological ethics also from the University of Chicago. Dr. Pope teaches courses on social and theological ethics He's written too many scholarly articles to mention in several books, including The Evolution of Altruism and the Ordering of Love, and also Human Evolution and Christian Ethics. He also served as the editor of Essays on the Ethics of St. Thomas Aquinas. Dr. Pope has received numerous awards and grants, including being a recipient of funding from the Templeton Foundation, which you know funds this lecture series. Furthermore, Dr. Pope is no stranger to Gordon, having given an excellent talk on human evolution and Christian ethics in 2012 for the Faith Seeking Understanding series. So if you really want to see him instead of me, you can go to YouTube, as I can uh, confirm that as of Monday, that talk was still up on YouTube. So I will read Dr. Pope's remarks, and then uh, uh, Dennis, I think maybe I will give you a couple minutes to respond if you would like to, and then we will open it up to questions from the audience. Last week, Pope Francis was in the headlines again, this time not for saying who am I to judge, but for a few simple words about evolution. When we read about creation in Genesis, we, want, we run the risk of imagining God was a magician with a magic wand able to do everything. But that is not so, Francis said. He created human beings and let them develop according to the internal laws that he gave to each one so they would reach their fulfillment. Something like this view has been held by the Catholic Church since 1950, but one writer for the Washington Post called this provocative and liberal. It would be for the 42% of Americans who believe that God created humans in their present form 10,000 years ago, according to the recent Gallup poll. Some Christians will view Professor Dennis Alexander like Pope Francis as liberal and provocative, unless that is you are a naturalist like Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris. For them, he is worse than the Pope because he should know better. Instead of being rational, he offers an extended theological rationale for the compatibility of evolutionary science and Christian faith. Instead of accepting that science refutes faith, he argues that they are mutually supportive. Indeed, Professor Alexander says, I do not leave behind my Christian worldview when I enter my laboratory to do experiments. Critics like Dawkins or Harris must think he's experimenting on the Eucharist or doing surgery on someone's soul. Professor Alexander offers a subtle and profound set of reflections on the complementarity of Christian faith and the scientific knowledge of nature. He provides a strong, scientifically informed account of evolutionary theism and does so with clarity and stylistic elegance. He deploys Thomas Aquinas' distinction between primary and secondary causality to show that Christian beliefs about God and God's relation to the world, properly understood, do not compete with scientific explanations of natural processes events and mechanisms. Professor Alexander believes Christian faith ought not to lead us to regard evolutionary theory as merely a theory or possible account of how organisms came to have the features they have. Faith should not lead us to deny any well-established findings of the natural science, for example, about the age of the earth or our evolutionary origins broadly construed. St. Augustine made this point long ago in one of his commentaries on Genesis 
but it seems to be a, have been forgotten by some Christians. Professor Alexander's presentation tonight focused on the content of the Christian affirmation of God as the maker of heaven and earth. He works from a broad theological position known as realism because he does not think that God talk is really just talk about human aspirations writ large. As I read it, this position steers between two extremes. The first, a fundamentalism that pits faith against science and insists on some version of biblical literalism. And the second, a liberal theology that regards faith as nothing but a complex expression of human aspirations laid over top of the real world that we come to grasp through the sciences. Professor Alexander describes his project as wanting to rebuild the Christian theological matrix. Yet since the, 19, since the 1999 film by that name, the term matrix refers to what is illusory. In the film, the matrix is a simulated reality constructed by sentient machines to keep human populations docile so that they can be exploited as energy sources for their makers. This might resonate with some Babylonian myth, but it is a far cry from the Christian God worshiped by Professor Alexander. The film lauds a few heroic individuals who break out of the matrix and liberate humanity, which is actually the way in which the new atheists envision their mission. Religion is the matrix and we have to break it to be free. Professor Alexander obviously does not use the matrix in this sense, I assume he's drawing on some kind of scientific or mathematical reasoning of the term of which I have no knowledge. Translated into theological terms, he wants to develop a Christian theology that shows the natural sciences to be fully compatible with, and in fact, even required by the Christian doctrine of creation. Science fits into the Christian worldview, not the other way around. At the same time, science can challenge some features of Christian belief. Professor Alexander's focus lies on God as primary cause, but God is often depicted biblically as an agent who does particular acts in the world. The language of primary causation is impersonal, abstract, and general, and not biblical. The language of God's mighty acts is personal, concrete, and anthropomorphic, and it runs throughout the Bible. Professor Alexander says that the Bible displays no concern at all in describing chance events as ordained by God. Yet the Bible does depict many particular events, from the Pharaoh's stubbornness to the giving of the covenant to Moses at Mount Sinai as ordained by God. Christians don't have faith in a first cause or unmoved mover, but in the God who brought the Hebrews out of Egypt and in the world made, word made flesh. So the question is, how can God as first cause and God as agent in the world be reconciled? Does all the biblical talk of God acting in the world amount merely to descriptions of human responses to the world? Or does God in some sense really act? Professor Alexander describes God as using chance events within what he calls gnomic regularity or necessity to bring about God's providential will. But presumably God, inf presumably God influenced the course of events in Joseph's life to bring good out of the evil his brothers intended. This is really the question of God's special providence, as distinct from the general providence that we see in the big picture that Professor Alexander so skillfully presents. Professor Alexander uses the image of top-down causation, but one can uh, imagine critics objecting that he is just using one metaphor to account for another, rather than offering a philosophical or theological explanation of how a divine first cause actually influences in particular ways, the movement of secondary causes. When I say pass the salt to my dinner companion and she passes the salt to me, we have just acted within a web of secondary causes. There is no primary cause here. In fact, my saying pass the salt may well reflect bottom-up causation if say my adrenal glands are malfunctioning or I'm dehydrated or have an electrolyte imbalance. Top-down causation has been used to draw an analogy just as our minds can influence our bodies, so God can influence the world. This makes intuitive sense, but it doesn't get us very far, because we know that our minds influence our bodies, including especially our brains, and vice versa, but we don't know how they do so. The same is true in spades for how God influences the world. Christians believe that God influences the world, but how? Professor Alexander stresses God's imminence in every moment, but ontological maintenance does not seem to account for say, Saul's experience on the road to Damascus or the resurrection of Jesus. 
A related set of questions might come from biblical scholars. In this presentation, he cites text from 2nd Isaiah, the Psalms, the first creation story in Genesis, Colossians, and the letter to the Hebrews in a way that sounds homogenizing. It might even be read as a kind of proof texting use of scripture to back up a Thomistic theology of creation. This might simply be due to limitations of space, but the use of scripture in the theology of creation developed here is an issue worth raising for discussion. This leads to another big question, namely, to what extent do scientific findings require us to reinterpret the meaning and or religious significance of either particular texts in scripture or particular Christian doctrines? Might some Christian findings require us out of intellectual honesty, sorry, might some scientific findings require us out of intellectual honesty to jettison certain Christian convictions about the nature of God or God's relation to the world? I will leave it with two big issues, anthropocentrism and salvation. First, most of Christian tradition has assumed that only human beings are created in the image of God and that we are the center of value in the world. Thomas Aquinas, for example, held that the salvation of one human soul was worth more than the entirety of the material universe. This anthropocentric assumption made sense when Christians relied on the geocentric cosmology of Aristotle. Now we know that we are a very tiny part of an unimaginably vast cosmos. What we have learned by science has undercut some of the conceit of our species, but it also gives us good reasons for doubting that all of creation was made for the sake of human flourishing. Second, Professor Alexander, for example, does not affirm the existence of a primeval couple who disobey God and then cast out of paradise. All of creation bears the scar of this event, and as St. Paul puts it, lies in a state of bondage to corruption, Romans 8.22. If there is no fall and no old Adam, then what happens to our faith in Christ as the new Adam? Conservative Christians worry that evolution undermines the doctrine of redemption. So the broad question here, stated too simplistically, is how are we now to interpret the meaning of original sin and our redemption in Christ? I will close by thanking Professor Alexander for his excellent presentation and by expressing my regret at being unable to attend this event.